Okay, if you want to get your Bibles, let's go to the book of 1 Corinthians and uh, continue our study of this book tonight. We have uh, we've got to be able to make some progress in this book if we have any opportunity to be able to finish it. We have covered most of chapter 7, and so I want us to pick up in the middle of that chapter and uh, try to proceed through there and uh, finish up the thoughts that Paul has in this chapter. When you pick up and read the book of 1 Corinthians, this is perhaps one of Paul's uh, better known epistles uh, for a number of reasons. There are a number of uh, familiar passages in it that we often turn to. Uh, There are passages that bring us uh, hope and comfort, like uh, chapter 10 and verse 13 that says we're not going to be tempted beyond that which we are able to bear. There are those passages that give us uh, instruction Uh, In the matters of worship, uh, like chapter 11, uh, verses uh, 17 through the end of the chapter, when we talk about the Lord's Supper, uh, there are uh, passages that uh, uh, deal with the matter of the the, uh, duration and the the ending of the spiritual gifts that are talked about in chapters 12 through 14. There's just so many things that we rely on the book of 1 Corinthians 4. And so uh, it's one of the epistles that we know perhaps a little bit better than we do some of, other, uh, some of the others. And we've spent uh, more time in chapter 7 than we have spent on any of the other chapters to this point, and primarily because uh, there's a lot of information there about the marriage relationship, God's design for the marriage relationship, and uh, the fact that uh, particularly, look in verse 26, and this is where we're going to pick up tonight. We have referenced verse 26 several times in this class. But uh, Paul is dealing with a situation... Uh, in the in the city of Corinth and and probably throughout um, the the uh, the the brotherhood at that time that he was dealing with uh, some sort of present distress that he talks about in chapter seven verse twenty six. So not only is God laying out his universal overall theme for marriage and that being especially like verses 10 and 11 that a man is not to depart from a a woman's not to depart from her husband a husband is not to uh, divorce his wife some general principles regarding marriage but he's also dealing with some specific uh, troubles that are present in the church or would soon be present uh, and most believe that this present distress was having something to do with a temporary period of uh, hardships or persecutions. And so when we read this, we need to keep that context in mind, especially in this section that we read here. Look at verse 25. He, he says, now concerning those who are unmarried or to the virgins, your translation may say. He says, I have no commandment from the, from the Lord, yet I give judgment as one whom the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. I suppose, therefore, that this is good because of the present distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. There were those, as he has been dealing with in this chapter, there were those Christians who were not married yet. Uh, And Paul says, if it's possible for you to remain unmarried, it would be beneficial for you to remain in that state because of this present distress. Um, But so it would be good for a man to remain as he is. Look at verse 27. Are you bound to a wife? Are you married to a wife? Then then don't seek to be loose. Just because there's a present distress doesn't mean, oh, well, I can divorce my wife now. No, if you are if you're married, then don't seek to uh, to to be loosed. You, You stay married. But if you are loosed, if you are not married, then perhaps at this time it's better that you don't seek a wife, that you may uh, pursue the things of God. But even if you do marry. It's not that they were not allowed to marry. He said, but even if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh, but I would spare you. Again, it's a a difficult time that was going to come upon them. And so he explains this. Look in verse 32. He explains this where he says, I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares, is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. If I'm not married, I don't have any uh, obligations to a spouse. And so I am able to concentrate fully on the things of the Lord and how I may please the Lord. Verse 33, 
But he who is married, and this is not a bad thing, but he who is married cares about the things of the world, specifically he's talking about how he may please his wife. That's the responsibility, isn't it, of a husband? Responsibility of a husband is to make sure he's doing those things that please his wife. What's the responsibility of a wife? Make sure she's doing those things that please her husband. There's no place, and we dealt with this in the first nine verses, or God dealt with it, we talked about it, in the first nine verses of this chapter, where God talked about the relationship between a husband and a wife, and how there is mutual responsibility. It's not all upon one of them. There's mutual responsibility to see after the needs of the other. To the point that God even said in those early verses of this chapter, the husband doesn't have authority over his body, but the wife does. Wife doesn't have authority over her body, but the husband does. There is a responsibility that we share to each other. And so God says in verse 33, those who are married, they have a responsibility to please their spouse. So they are not able to focus 100% on their relationship with God because they do have these other obligations. And so when you're heading into, and remember the context here, when you're heading into a time of severe persecution or of this distress that was going to come upon them, Paul is saying, if you at all can remain unmarried so that you can focus 100% on remaining faithful to the Lord, then that that would be a good thing, but he's not demanding that be the case. Look at verse 34. He says the unmarried woman in verse 34, the unmarried, you might have the word virgin there, and he uses, it's used interchangeably, the word virgin, the word unmarried. The unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she who is married cares, the things, cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Notice that God does not just approach it from the husband's perspective. He makes sure that he approaches this from both the husband and the wife's perspective. I think we could have implied in those verses 31, 32, and 33 that what he directs to the husband could also be directed to the wife, but he also turns it around. And he does say, the end of verse 33, that the husband's responsibility is to see to it that he pleases his wife. The end of verse 34, the wife's responsibility is to see to it that she pleases her husband. And this I say, verse 35, for your own profit. Not that I may put a leash on you. I'm not trying to bind or restrain you. uh, But because of this present distress, I'm telling you what is proper. That you may serve the Lord without distraction. Sometimes in that time of persecution, there could have been a benefit uh, to not being married. But uh, remember, keep it in the context. There are too many people who have come to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and have, and have tried to put paint Paul into a light that says Paul was not in favor of marriage. And, uh, uh, and he didn't want people to get married. And he told people that, that they should just remain as he is. And, uh, and that marriage was not really high on, uh, high on a priority list. Put it in the context. The context is a present distress is coming and you need to be prepared to make sure that you serve the Lord. And when you keep it in that context, there's a better understanding. Verse 36. He addresses a situation and uh, the, translations, the translations treat this differently. Uh, Some translations, when you read verses 36 through 38, uh, some translations approach this and translate it from the standpoint of a father and what a father does in relationship to his daughter and whether he allows his daughter to marry. Or your translation may approach this from the standpoint of uh, of an individual, a man, who is betrothed or engaged to a woman and what he is to do to have a proper relationship and care for her in that, in, in that, st- in that sense. So depending on what translation you have, it may be, your translation may be looking at it from the father's standpoint or your translation may be looking at it from the, the, the fiancé, the betrothed man's standpoint and how he relates to the one he's betrothed to. Um, the reason for that, 
Uh, and there's, there's a number of reasons. Let me just give one that might help you to, uh, to have a better understanding. In, in the Greek language, uh, they did not have a, a separate word to talk about necessarily. It could be implied in the context. They did not have a separate word to talk about man, husband, and father. Sometimes in the Greek language, it was just one word. They just used the Greek word on air, which means man. And the context would indicate maybe it's talking about a husband. When, when you read passages where it's talking about uh, the relationship between a husband and a wife, um, God may be using the word on air to talk about the man, but because of the context is talking about marriage, it would be properly translated husband. Um, and so... Uh, uh, you know, even in this even in this chapter, it has talked about uh, let every let every man ha, ha, let every woman have her own man. Some translations might say, but it, the meaning is let her have her, her own husband. So perhaps that's the reason that uh, that some have approached this from both the father's standpoint and from the betrothed. It from the just from reading it and the context, it seems like and and it. Uh, it would be difficult to, uh, to be very dogmatic about this, but it seems like it's better to approach this from the betrothed standpoint rather than from the fathers. Uh, and that's just uh, from my study of it. Uh, you can't approach it from either standpoint. But let's start in verse 36, try to make sense of it. If any man thinks he is behaving, this is the New King James, and I'm going to uh, change to some of the words from the New American Standard. If any man thinks he is behaving improperly, Toward his, and you might have the word virgin, uh, you might have the word betrothed. Um, I don't know that anybody has the word daughter, but it's possible that some translation might have the word daughter. Uh, if, if you are a man who's thinking that you're behaving improperly toward your betrothed, the one you are engaged to, or your translation may approach it from the father's standpoint to the daughter. If she is past the flower of youth, and thus it must be, meaning they've got to get married. It, it, go, go back, it, to put that in the context, go back to verse 9 of this same chapter. The end of verse 8, he says it is good for them if they remain unmarried, as Paul was, but if they cannot exercise self-control. Here's talking about two people who were, uh, who were not married but were in. Uh, but we're looking to get married. And Paul says, you know, because of this present distress, it'd be good if you can remain unmarried so you can focus 100% on the Lord. But, verse 9, he says, if they cannot exercise self-control, they need to get married. Why? It is better to marry than to burn. So if you cannot control the passions, then this couple needs to get married so that they're not sinning uh, or not tempted uh, or put in a situation to sin in the, in the eyes of God. That's the same idea that we have over in, thir in verse 36, where it says, if she's past the flower of youth, and it must be, uh, because of those, uh, uh, there's just a, a very difficult situation in controlling it, then let him do what he wishes. Let him go ahead and marry her. He's saying at the end of verse 36, he does not sin if they get married. Again, in the context, present distress would be better if they didn't. But if they are betrothed and they decide to get married, then, uh, then that is fine. They can go ahead and get married. Nevertheless, verse 37, he who stands uh, steadfast in his heart, meaning if, if he can control himself, somebody who can uh, control his passions, if he can do that, and there is no necessity... He, he doesn't have to get married uh, in order not to burn. He, he, he can control his passions. He has power over his own will and has so determined in his heart that he will keep uh, his virgin or keep her as his betrothed, then he does well. If, if he can keep her just as his betrothed, they don't engage in premarital sex, but they can control themselves and they do well so they can focus on serving God during this present distress. So then, and here's where translations differ quite a bit in verse 38. So then he who marries the betrothed, which I think is a better translation there. Some translations may say 
he who gives her to be married, approaching it from the father's standpoint, where he gives his daughter to be married, and that, that could work here too. But from the betrothed standpoint, he who goes ahead and, uh, and marries his betrothed, uh, he does well, but he who does not marry her does even better. And again, in the context, uh, that would make sense. You all have any comments or, or questions through verse 38? There's a lot of information there. Giselle? No? Just waving? Uh, Pat? Pat? Uh, no. Yeah, I, I, I don't know that I would cross it out. She, in, the, uh, in the New American Standard, uh, Pat has the word daughter, but it is in italics. Uh, in verse 38, the New King James has her uh, in italics. Uh, again, because the, the, word, the word is not there. Uh, the, 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 the defining of the one that is being betrothed or married that, that word is not there, and so therefore it's hard to approach it. Is it giving her or is it taking her? Um, and, you know, it's, the reality is it's not a big deal for us to know which one was he talking about. Because in either situation, it would apply. And the point was that it's better if it's possible, and he uses the word better at the end of verse 38, it would be better if they could remain single so that they can make it through this, this persecution. But if they can't control their passions, then they need to get married. But they need to be determined once they get married that they're going to work together to serve God. Um, so just keep it in its context, and I think it keeps a, a meaning to it. Jerry? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's it again. Uh, New American Standards. Jerry says talks about uh, uh, giving his. Uh, he who gives her uh, gives his own. Uh, gives his own uh, in marriage, uh, and again, be, there's just a there's an indefinite. Uh, uh, situation as, as to the giving and the taking and the receiving and the, and the person. Uh, and, and the reality is, again, it's not a big deal for us to know which way it's going. The, the, truth is, the truth is the same for both of them, whether it's talking about the father or for the betrothed. Uh, the point is, it's fine if they get married. It's better if they don't uh, for this situation. So just... Just be aware of the fact that we don't need to take and we don't need to allow others to take these verses out of their context. You say, well, you know, it, Paul said it'd be better for you not to get married. No, Paul wasn't talking to you. Pa Paul's not telling us it'd be better for you not to get married. That would be a misuse of this passage. Um, you know, if, if, if you and I are about ready to go into a, a, a situation of, of strong persecution against us as Christians, then maybe we, we have a leg to stand on in, in, in context. Uh, but not to, not to pull it out of its context, ever. Yeah, I have a question. Um, what does this actually mean? Did she pass the flower of her age? Uh, if she passed the flower of her age, if she passed the flower of age, yeah. What what age is that? What does that actually mean? Well, it, it's it's not a uh, uh, the the maturity the uh, the. Uh, level of, of a child, it's, there's no age put uh, definitively on it. Uh, does your translation have the word age? Uh, some translations may have just the, she has passed the flower of her youth. Uh, you know, that, that there, there is a process and she, she has now uh, entered and gone beyond the state of what we would call puberty. Uh, and and that, that has been, that, she has gone through that and she is at the point now where she's, she's ready to be married. Uh, she's not a child anymore. She has passed the state of being a, a child in that sense. Phil? One thing to remember, a lot of uh, girls were betrothed very young. Yes. And even as young, some of you can see them. Sure. Of them seven, eight, nine years. Right. 
And, and so that, that's another qualification here is that uh, in, in that in that day, in that culture, as Phil says, some of some of the girls would be betrothed as girls. They weren't married. Uh, they didn't marry them off. But, you know, this day of arranged marriages where, where they would be they would be uh, betrothed early on. Well, just just because two eight year olds were betrothed doesn't mean, you know, they needed to go and get married. She this particular one has passed that point and is is now in a situation where she is old enough uh, and uh, and mature enough uh, to, to be in that situation. Anything, Chuck? I got full age. F- a full age. Uh, and, and what that age is, it varies, doesn't it? Um, and, and even today we, we know that to be true. Look at the last two verses of this chapter. We said it last week, but it bears repeating. That when you get to verse 39, this is the first time in in this 40 verse chapter, this is the first time in this chapter that Paul says or does anything with the topic of remarriage. It's not dealt with prior to this point. He has dealt with marriage and he has dealt with divorce. But there has not been discussion about, okay, if I'm divorced, what about after that? This is the first time that he gets to talk about someone who would get married again. And the one he's talking about in verse 39 is a widow. Now notice again the, the foundational overall principle for marriage that God gives. He gave some in verses 10 and 11. Gives another one here in verse 39. Where he says a wife is bound by law. How long? As long as her husband lives. Um, it doesn't mean anything today in our marriage ceremonies, and so it's been removed from probably most of them. But a lot of marriage ceremonies in recent years have said, uh, made vows until death do us part. Did you say that in your marriage vows? Uh, Did you mean it when you said it? There's a lot of people who apparently said it, didn't mean it. Um... Until death do us part. Where does that come from? Right here. A wife is bound by law to her husband as long as he lives. What does that say about the permanency of marriage? What does that say about God's design for marriage? When God brought the woman to the man in Genesis chapter 2, how long did he want them to stay together? Until Adam could get a younger and prettier uh, girl to come along? I mean, seriously, when, when Adam married Eve, she was already a grown woman, right? Yeah, you know, a few years down the road, you know, there'd be somebody. Imagine being Adam. He was married for more than 900 years. Hello? Don't you think that there was some younger, prettier thing that came along like 700 years after they'd been married? And Whoa, you know, she's, she, she doesn't have a walker like Eve does. You know, what, what's the deal? When God put them together, what was his design? For for 50 years, 100 years, 900 years. Some of you are thinking, I'm glad I didn't live back then. You know, you're you're thinking 50 is not so bad. You you know, it's um, a wife is bound by law to her husband as long as he lives. Jesus said what God has joined together, what's man supposed to do? It's not up to man to to separate them. That's God's overriding rule for marriage. But, verse 39, if her husband dies, she is at liberty. It's interesting he mentions the word liberty here. um, Because while it's it's in a different sense, the whole of chapter 8 is about liberty, Christian liberty. Uh, And so it's an interesting uh, kind of transition to the next chapter. But she is at liberty to be married. To who? Whomever she wishes. Cool. So her husband dies and she can go marry anybody she wants to. That's what it says. Whom she wishes. Oh, God didn't put a period, did he? Just put a comma. Only. What does the word only mean? Is there, is, is there, like, a, is there like another possibility when you use the word Only. When you use that word with your kids, is there another possibility? They're looking for one. Only in the Lord. Was it last week or week before that we jumped ahead and we talked about this verse? And 
in recognition that, uh, that some approach that phrase in the Lord and uh, they want to apply it as an adverb uh, to say that the, uh, the, the conditions under which she marries need to be consistent with what the Lord would want and with his, uh, with his will. And so they, they adverbally say that the marriage is to be only in the Lord. Others approach it to say that she's free to marry whom she wishes only in the Lord, and they approach it as an adjective to say that the only in the Lord is not referring, it's not modifying the verb like an adverb would do, but is modifying the noun, the person that she marries, and that the person that she marries is to only be somebody who is in the Lord. The weight of the evidence for one of those two options seems to favor heavily the adjective. Most of the time when you read the phrase in the Lord uh, in, in the New Testament, it is used as an adjective to modify a noun rather than an adverb to modify a verb. And also notice that if you're looking for what this is modifying, the noun is the closest. Mary, whom she wishes, the whom is the closest modifier to say, okay, who does she wish to marry? Well, here's somebody who's in the Lord. And so there's been a lot of discussion and, and I have had uh, several, uh, a number of written discussions with, uh, with some uh, individuals about whether this is an adverb or whether this is an adjective um, to say that, well, this isn't talking about what they have, some have claimed, this isn't talking about that the person has to be a Christian. Um, she just needs to marry in a way that would be pleasing to the Lord. Well, even if she was supposed to marry adverbally in a way that was pleasing to the Lord, would it be possible for a widow to marry someone who is outside of Christ and that be pleasing to the Lord? You know, he says here, verse 40, if she is happier, if she remains as she is, Paul says, I think that's fine. Why? Because you back up into the earlier verses, if she remains as she is, she can focus 100% on the Lord. But a widow is free from the law of her husband. She's able to marry again. But if she marries again, would it be appropriate for her to marry someone who is not a child of God? How would that help her to serve the Lord? And if God is modifying who a widow is to marry in chapter 7 and verse 39, and we pointed this out last time, but in chapter 9 and verse 5, Paul is talking about how he or one of the other apostles or one of the other um, uh, leaders or, uh, could take along a believing wife, a sister. If, he says, if we wanted to take along a spouse with us, but he modifies that spouse to say, this person would be a Christian. If widows, when they, if they're going to get married again, should marry Christians. And if the apostles, if they were going to get married, if they should marry a Christian. What about other people who get married? What, 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 about, uh, what about young adults who get married for the first time? You think it matters to God if they marry a Christian or if they marry a non-Christian? You know, I, I, and I understand that uh, there's been a lot of discussion about that. Uh, when God says things like, uh, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, does, does that command impact the choice of who someone marries? Put the Lord and his kingdom first in your life. Okay, I'm going to get married. Does that marriage decision filter through Matthew 6.33? I mean, every other decision we make should filter through Matthew 6.33, shouldn't we? I mean, am I doing this? Is this helping me to seek the Lord first in his kingdom? What about marriage? Is marrying a Christian? Is that going to help me to seek the Lord first in his kingdom? Uh, Jerry? Yep. Second Corinthians chapter six and verse 14 is a great passage uh, to look at where uh, where Paul begins a series of questions. Um, and in the beginning of the verse in chapter six, and verse 14, Paul says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, contextually. Is Paul talking about marriage in the context, not specifically in the context? 
But if two people are going to be yoked together, and that's the imagery in chapter 6, verse 14, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Um, it may not be the most flattering illustration of marriage, but when two people get married, are they yoked together? Are they put into a yoke? You know what a yoke is. You, you, the farmer's out there plowing his field and he's got a yoke of oxen. He, he's, got, he's got a pretty oxen on this side and he's got an ugly fat male oxen on that side. All right, that's just to help some of you out to see the difference. Now, so he's got two oxen inside that yoke. Are they stuck together? Can they get out of it? Can, can that oxen reach his hoof up there and beat that thing off of his head so he can get away from her? Can she do that to him? No, but when they're yoked together, they can kick each other, right? You know, so, you know, we're yoked here together, but that doesn't mean I can't kick you. Um, do not be unequally yoked together. When two people are, what did Jesus say? What God has joined together. Could you not say what God has yoked together? Now, when God yokes a husband and a wife together, what does 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 14 say? What does God, when we're in that yoke, is it a good idea for a Christian to be in a yoke with a non-Christian? Now look, look at that series of questions that he begins in chapter 6 and verse 14 of 2 Corinthians and carries on down through verse 17. And, and, he, and he poses the, these contrasts. What, what fellowship? What, what harmony? What, what things do the, what do these have in common? Light and darkness, uh, Christ and Belial, and, and righteousness and unrighteousness. What, what do these have in common? Nothing. What do they share? Nothing. What about a Christian and a non-Christian? What do they share? Oh, we, we, we've got similar interests. We, uh, we, we, both like to, uh, we both like to go out to eat. Neither one of us likes to cook. We are just made for each other. You know, we, uh, we, we've got similar interests. We both like the same kind of music. We like the same sports teams. We both hate the same sports teams. So that makes us, you know, uh, work together well. What would be the, the greatest thing to have in common when you're in that yoke together? Um. When, when those two oxen are in a yoke together, are they moving forward? Well, what should they be doing? Are they moving forward or backwards? The design is for them to move forward. Together or separately? Oh, it's a lot easier if they're together. And they're going together, forward, uh, in that yoke together. Do they have a goal? Well, their master does. Does the master have a goal for them? The master says, you're going that way. And I want a straight line, straight and narrow maybe, a straight line and I want you both to go that way and do it together. Now, you could do it by yourself and just drag the other one along with you. That's going to be kind of tough, isn't it? Uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 22, the last in the closing verses of that chapter, when God says, do not plow with an ox and a donkey together. Come on. We have this book. Full of commands from God about morality, about spirituality, about religion, my relationship with God, my relationship with my brethren. And God throws a command in there, one of the 613 in the Old Testament, where God says, don't plow with an ox and a donkey. Why is God giving agricultural commands? Pardon? Because he made the earth. Does God know what would be best to plow with? Why don't you put an ox and a donkey in the same yoke together? They don't fit. Do, do they have anything in common? Let's see. They have four legs. All right. So we got that going. They both have hair. Um, they're both ugly. I mean, we, we could find some things in common. Do they have some differences? Oh, yeah. Like what? The biggest difference of all. They're two different things. Christian and a non-Christian, do they have some similarities? Yeah, they're both people. They have two legs, two arms, two eyes. Do they have some differences? Yeah, big ones. And you put the two of them in a yoke together, and it's like putting an ox and a donkey together. One's going to be stronger than the other trying to make it towards that goal, and what's the other one going to be? 
not so much interested in going down that path. Now, come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Don't misunderstand. We looked in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verses 13 and 14 where apparently the church had asked, here I am, I am a Christian. My spouse is not a Christian. What should I do? If I'm a Christian and my spouse is not a Christian, should I divorce them, get rid of them because, you know, they're, they're holding me back? Should I divorce them so that I can concentrate on God? What does God say in verses 13 and 14? No. Overall principle, you, verses 10 and 11, a husband, wife, neither one is to depart from the other. And if you're married to a non-Christian, if that non-Christian is going to stay married to you, you don't leave them. So there is a difference between talking about people who are already married and rightly married in the eyes of God and those who are getting ready to get married. The verb in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, um, the verb there is stop becoming unequally yoked together. He was not saying, if you are unequally yoked together, break it. That's not what he's saying. And he says that in chapter 7, verse 13 and 14 here. If you are unequally yoked together, that doesn't mean you separate. That's, but if you are not yet yoked, if you still have a decision, if you still have the opportunity to decide uh, and with whom you are yoked, you need to decide to make sure that it's going to be somebody who can help you uh, get to heaven. If we find ourselves in a situation where I am married already, got married uh, in the past, one of us is now a Christian, one is not. What does verse 14 say uh, about, about that relationship? Chapter 7, verse 14. What does it say? What, what, what can happen? Does not, the, uh, does not the Christian, the believer, does, does not that person sanctify Set apart and help the unbeliever to, uh, to have a, a better lifestyle and a better home. What about the children? Are, are, are not the children in a better situation than they would be if they were two non-Christians in the home? Well, they are in a better situation. Then verse 16, chapter 7, verse 16, he says, For do you not know? How do you know, he says, whether you will save your wife? How do you know if you won't save your husband? And that's what 1 Peter chapter 3 also says. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1 where it talks about a, a, a Christian woman who is married to a non-Christian man. And, and God says there, you know, you might even without a word. You don't have to beat him over the head. But just by your godly lifestyle might be able to save your husband. So that's, uh, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Um, any, uh, any thoughts or questions uh, to this point? Any comments you want to make? All right, let, let, let's, let's get into chapter 8, and let me just give you an overall picture of chapter 8. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul again changes gears. Look at the first verse. Look at the first words of chapter 8, verse 1, and the first words of chapter 7, verse 1. Compare chapter 7, verse 1 with chapter 8, verse 1. Do they not start the same way? Chapter 7, verse 1, now concerning the things. Chapter 8, verse 1, now concerning the... They, Again, in chapter 7, Paul begins dealing with questions they have written to him. So apparently in chapter 8, he's dealing with another question. And the question that they have written to him goes something along the line of, what are we supposed to do about meat, about animals that have been sacrificed to idols? We know in the Old Testament that God told the Jews to take animals and to sacrifice those animals to him, um, the pagans, without being original at all, the pagans came along and adopted that same practice to offer, to offer animal sacrifices, sometimes human sacrifices, to offer animal sacrifices to the idols, to their gods. And so for some Christians who had come out of paganism, for some Christians they're looking at this meat and the meat had been offered to an idol. And now they're asking, I'm not supposed to eat that, am I? I mean, that, that meat was dedicated to, to this idol. I'm not, I'm not supposed to even get near that, am I? And as Paul deals with that in this chapter, 
The, the, the one answer is that, uh, that the meat itself is not unholy. The meat itself is not defiled. It's just meat. What does 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 5 say? The Bible there says what, that, uh, that, that the food is sanctified, set apart by prayer. How do, you know, how do you know where the meat that you, came, that you ate today or whatever you ate today, how do you know where it came from? How do you know it wasn't offered to an idol somewhere before it landed on your plate? I hope you prayed for it because 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5 says when you prayed for it, it sanctified it. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it was offered to an idol. Once it lands on your plate, if you thank God for it, it's now sanctified to you. What did God say to Peter in Acts chapter 10? What I have set apart, what I have made holy, you should not call common or unclean. Now, here's the problem in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. There were some brethren, we got 30 seconds. There were some brethren who were stronger in their faith than others. There were some brothers who were weaker in their faith, newer to the faith, newer Christians. And Paul is dealing with the fact that there are some strong Christians who look at this, the meat sacrificed to idols. And these strong Christians say, it's meat, doesn't matter, I can eat it. And in fact, they may even go to a party uh, at, at, uh, and later down of what is it, verse 10. They may go to a party that's even at one of these temples where, where they are uh, a pagan temple and they're eating this meat. And there's nothing wrong with that. But God says if that weaker Christian sees you doing it, they think it's wrong. They think it's wrong and sinful and they see you doing it. He says, if you cause them to stumble, you've just sinned. You were not doing anything that would be sinful except if it lays a stumbling block in, the front, in front of your brothers. So we'll look at this chapter a little bit more next week and we'll, and we'll move on into chapter 9 carrying the same thought. But we need, to be, we need to be aware of the fact, the kind of influence that we have on other people. And how other people see us uh, through our actions as Christians. Thank you all for your good attention tonight.